Another unfortunate casualty to tide of time, insane asylums. I lament their loss, not only as brokerage houses for the breadth and depth of human psychosis, but also I shall mourn the disappearance of that peculiar environment present only in an insane asylum. That palpable atmosphere of blistered brains and churning bowels, the odiferous melange of freely flowing bodily humors, that gently rolling cacophony of distant sobs and screams, the muttered cursing at perceived enemies, and the blissful gurgling of the lobotomized, like a newborn babe discovering the sky. Hmm. Eh, I shall still find test subjects as surely as I find bloody sustenance in the night, but this climate, I fear, may never be replicated. My studies proceed at a languid pace. I'm mired in a foul ennui as my wife's illness advances. My subjects grow restless without proper supervision, but I cannot pull myself back from this black depression. How many nights I've wasted now, gazing from the tower walk, pondering the frailty of existence. After decades of solitary study into this affliction, I have learned that it is by no means mine alone. Indeed, the city is home to an entire society of similarly afflicted individuals with whom I've only recently made contact. 
They are an understandably standoff sort by and large, but I have been able to confirm with them that the condition is indeed vampirism, which apparently comes in a multitude of strains, each with a spectacular set of symptoms such as invisibility and even a sort of lycanthropy. Through numerous official interactions with the governing body of this secret society, I have concluded that their fundamental understanding of the vampiric condition is woefully lacking and mired in suspicion and pseudo-religious dogma that would make a Turk balk for its strictures. Indeed, they seemed impressed with my studies and the eloquence with which I was able to present them. Apparently, the typical sufferer of my particular strain of vampirism is far from the vanguard of the king's English. So impressed were they that they even offered me an office in their government, and rather an high office by the sound of things, I believe I shall accept. If nothing else, it should provide a lofty vantage point from which to observe the breadth and epidemiology of the affliction, so that I may move more expeditiously toward a cure. As I expand my dealings with the vampire government, I have encountered a disturbing new symptom of this affliction. Frequently, in conversation, I will hear voices emanating from other vampires, voices that are not their own, but which seem to have insight into their lives beyond what I could gather from simple conversation. These voices seem to echo from deep within my fellow vampires, and I cannot be certain if this symptom belongs to my strain of the illness or theirs. For the voices are various and inconsistent. I dare not mention this symptom to my vampiric peers, for they have proven themselves true predators to whom I could be loath to reveal any sign of weakness. Indeed, these voices have counseled me against confessing their presence, and until I can confirm their source, I will listen. The information the voices have given me ranges from curious to frightening. The latter case is especially true of one powerful vampire whose name I shall not commit to recording in the interests of self-preservation. The voices have increased in frequency and direction of late. They have begun to stay with me long after conversation has ceased and are serving as quite a distraction. I fear others are beginning to notice my preoccupation. The fear must register on my face as it is all I can do in these moments to keep from crying out in chorus with the voices.
Lord, I will cleanse your black soul! 